Just a quick note to add on to here. I accidentally said CD Projekt Red was a Swedish developer. They're actually a Polish developer. My apologies. Just It might come up at some point during the episode, so just letting you know. Thank you very much. Travis out. Welcome to Third Coast Gaming Impressions. Uh, today is December 16th. That is Wednesday, my dude. We're here. I'm joined by Austin Taylor. Howdy. Ha- yeehaw. <laughs> it's me, Travis Doyle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cyberpunk's a video game. We've both been playing it. I guess we can talk about it a little bit. Um, I wanted to go through how it runs. We can talk about its setting and its history a little bit. I guess we'll talk about CD Projekt Red, how it runs, and then we can get into some story stuff. Yeah, good. So, yeah, so we want to start with setting talk. Yeah, so I was going to talk about, like, what, they announced this game in 2013? Yeah, this game got a sort of cinematic teaser from CD Projekt in, 20, in, like, 2013. And that was, like, a year after they announced that they had, like, acquired the, like, license to make this game, basically. Yeah, and then I think they were also finishing up The Witcher 3 to release in 2015. So I think they were putting some more time to finish that because it ended up being a bigger project and so yeah i'm guessing from like a majority of the work on this game is probably from 2015 to like i don't know 2020 and then them fixing bugs which i mean we'll get into this game's kind of buggy it's in the same vein as like a bethesda open world game where it's got some stuff like that a little just a little bugs you know. Yeah, CD Projekt Red, known for Witchers 1 through 3, and before that they were doing helping with, like, what was that, Baldur, some Baldur's Gate stuff? Yeah, so, like, Translating. Baldur's Gate, yeah, so, like, the Polish localization of Baldur's Gate is, like, how CD Projekt gets, like, its start, really. It's, like, yeah. that's how they get um, to the point where, like, they can now, like, run GOG, which is their, like, PC storefront for video games. Oh, do they run GOG? Yeah, yeah, so GOG is owned by CD Projekt. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, or the, I guess the CD Projekt group, since like they technically call themselves that, since they have CD Projekt Red, which is their game development studio. Oh, they post their financials on their website, too. I'm going to be curious to see. Because Witcher 3 sold about... They made about... This financial data just says... 800,000? I don't know if that's units or <laughs> I think... or what. I just got into a tangent over here, but yeah, I don't know. This I'm playing this on an Xbox One S and it's a little... It looks like it's on a low setting. It's on a PC. I don't think it's optimized for those base consoles. If you're on a Pro, you were telling me it runs a little better. Yeah, like on a Pro, it still looks like pretty kind of rough. You know, it runs a bit better than what I've seen run on, like, the base Xbox One and PS4. But it's still, like, subject to crashes and texture load-in. I played a couple of the early stuff. I I haven't been in the open world as much. Is that where you're getting most of your crashes, is in the open world, or is it during story missions? I'd say, like, I mean, it's it's a bit of both, right? Like, during two story sequences, I've, like, where it's specifically during story sequences revolving around the brain dances, um, is where I had, like, two pretty sudden crashes when it, like, loaded from the brain dance back into the game. Um, yeah, I did that part, too, yeah. So, the, um, so in, so this was stuff that was in, like, the preview events that they were kind of coming out with. They're kind of letting people play like the first three or four levels. Yeah, the brain dance ends up being like a. Um, I'll explain. The way I see it is a, it's like a video sequence that you're doing like um, detective stuff in, and you have like a video line and like an audio line. And yeah. there's certain events that come up. These are like pre crap, pre captured footage that are someone's memories of an event that happened before, and you're trying to plan a heist, and the, and you're trying to steal something out of this guy's house. So there's some certain things that happen that you're like recording and going back and you can move around in their memory as if it was like 
kind of like a video game, I guess. Yeah, so like the like the most similar thing in like games for brain dance would be like the uh like Batman Arkham Origins sequences where you would walk around and recreate like a uh, a crime scene by going around a room and just sort of analyzing things like blood spatter patterns and like bullet holes that like have been embedded into walls and like the thing with a brain dance is these are specifically like memories that are captured and stored and edited to provide specific experiences the place where you go to actually start analyzing the brain dance or the memories of this woman who's helping you plan this heist is like uh, you're basically in a brothel right a brothel that specializes in editing uh, like smut brain dances yeah and um you know i i hadn't i didn't have any crashes at all i did that whole sequence i think that was the last thing i did if we were to gauge like my progress there since this is like early impressions for me but um i did turn everything off like there was like chromatic aberration and like like a bunch of display settings that if you yeah, like fill in grain correct and yeah. then like it'll blur the background and stuff i turned them all off and i seemed to run it might be running a little better for me did you yeah. turn those on or off on your end no i turned that all off okay cool I, absolutely I wonder if it just it'll just grab something that it doesn't like and it'll just like you know crash you know that's that's usually how crashes end up doing is if something lines up in a certain way that it doesn't like it has to like it just can't process it or something yeah um i would say like if you are experiencing crashes you might have to go back and turn those settings back off because yeah. after a crash that I had on my on my run, um, I did have to like go back into the settings and like turn everything back off because it doesn't seem to save them. Yeah, to go into setting a little bit. Yeah, this is like based off of a uh, the Cyberpunk twenty twenty RPG. Is it just and Cyberpunk before that, where it's like I would describe it as a Dungeons and Dragons tabletop game, but set in a dystopian like Blade Runner or Ghost in the Shell type world where you're hacking and doing jobs and being a mercenary among we, some other things. You've you played Cyberpunk the tabletop a little more than I have. I've played Zero. I think you were talking to me about it last week, right? Yeah, so like the original like version of Cyberpunk is like this a uh, Cyberpunk twenty twenty is this, you know, pen and paper game. Uh it's like published in like the late eighties, eighty eight, I believe specifically. Um, and it's just a lot of like the whole, like the whole thing about this is like one of the core tenets here is like style over substance. So it is like, it is a pen and paper RPG that like has the kind of campaign nature that you can assign to like, you know, like D and D, like you said, um, but it wants to be like, it arguably speaking, it puts a lot more emphasis on like following something like the rule of cool in a real way than it's like than what D and D does, which like these are like the rules and like the mechanics of this game. And like Cyberpunk has all of those, and you can follow all those, but those are mostly guidelines uh, to sort of push you in a direction where y'all are just doing some really wild stuff in Night City, which is this sort of dystopian, uh, fictional like version of what is basically L.A. Yeah, and to speak on like the idea of this game wanting this game wants to be really cool and edgy and it wants you to know that it's that like in the very beginning of the game so i picked a nomad and i'm hanging out with um god i can't remember his last name but his first name's jackie and he's kind of like your best friend in the beginning what was his last name again sir wells well so jackie wells this guy you're hanging out with he's like this buff hispanic dude and he's pretty chill and he's like I'm driving with him, and he's like, oh, yeah, man, night fucking city, this is the place to go. And I was like, oh, this game is using Jackie to hype this city for me. And when you get to the city, it's like, you know, a dystopian future. It's I don't think it's that cool. Is it? But, like, this game is just hyping you to get into this city. It just wants you to hang out and go be a mercenary and stuff. But I, th- I, I thought that was a. 
Yeah. What I keep hearing those characters say and stuff. Yeah, like, Jackie is very much, like, he believes in, like, the myth of Night City, right? Like, the sort of, the belief that, like, the people, people go to Night City to become legends, right? Like, Night City's where you get people like Johnny Silverhand, Morgan Blackhand. Yeah, and... Are they, are they, are they both hands? Did I just... I guess. Maybe. All right. Uh, some of the mission people you meet later, and they are very like prominent to what I would call the interior lore of Night City, and I think they show those characters show up in the tabletop RPG too, right? Or are they new? Yeah. Characters for this? Yeah. So Johnny Silverhand like is the main character of an adventure that comes with the 2020 core rulebook, which is um, highlights sort of his first sort of terrorist attack, you know, air quote terrorist attack on the company, the Arasaka Corporation, which has been for since pretty much the inception of this game, kind of the easiest like antagonist, like the easiest company to make an antagonist, right? Because um they have so much more going on beneath the surface of their company within even like the fiction presented in like just the core rule book then i'd say like any other company like militech or anything mike so this game really wants you to get in there um i, I guess we can talk about story a little bit I, i'm curious what the difference is between so you get like three starting paths and i think those are the three classes in the cyberpunk tabletop right is nomad corpo and street punk well those are street kid Kind of, kind of, right? So within 2020, life paths are like, life paths is a whole process where you decide where you come from, who your parents are, romantic attachments, right? So like within the tabletop RPG, life paths are like a very complicated thing. What they do in 2077 is they like give you some shorthand for it, for like your background. So Nomad and Corpo, meaning... Uh, nomad being someone who does not live in a city you live on like caravans like of cars and sort of uh you basically you move around like a band does right yeah and you and do that all the time just, big about family. Like when you're, if you're a nomad they all take care of each other so i picked the yeah. nomad beginning choice and i think you picked street kid yeah i did choose the i did choose the street kid yeah. uh because i decided i wanted to be someone who like is in night city yeah, uh, but not, kid. not working for the for the corporation, not working for the man, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing with like the corpo path is you're like a disgraced corporate, right? You don't get to stay a corporate officer for very long. Like within your introduction, you're thrown out of um, the Arasaka Corporation, which is who you work for. Yeah. And with the Nomad, the beginnings of that was I show up to like the exterior of Night City because I'm trying to run a job for someone so i'm picking up some stuff from jackie and we're trying to smuggle it into the city and we reluctantly become friends because like we both get screwed over basically yeah and then i get to climb a ubisoft tower and plug my radio into it i hope there's only one tower that i climb as a joke i hope that's a joke ubisoft joke but so what's the street kid how do you start out are you hanging out with jackie already are you both no, so like as as a street kid starts out and you are someone who left Night City like two years ago to go find something new in Atlanta, but you're back now and you start out like sort of setting a broken nose uh, because you were just mugged in a bar. I believe it's the Coyote Bar, which is the bar that Jackie's mother runs. And you get sort of you get wrangled into a mission for the bartender. A uh, man by the name who's only ever identified as uh, as Pepe to sort of help oh, him get Pepe. out of his debt. Yeah, to help him get out of his debt. And so you go in, you talk to this fixer called Kirk, who's like, "I want you to steal this really high end car for me." Yeah, uh, fixers are guys who set up jobs for people. They're basically quest givers. Yeah. Oh, but there's so much more. There's yeah. so much more. Gonna... Um, <laughs> and. You know, you go to get this fancy car from him. You meet up with, like, your old, uh, I don't want to say, like, your old fixer, but, like, an old friend who is, I believe, the head of the Valentino's gang that exists within, the, like, this part of Night City. His name is Padre. 
you go he drops you off at like the garage to get this car you go you break into it and like as you're about to take off with it jackie puts a gun to your head and he's like hey i'm here to steal this car for my own reasons oh, and then no. you, you both get uh then the fuzz show up um they sort of arrest y'all but they don't do anything with you they just like kick you out into the street mm. uh, as soon as you do because like the dude, the investigator who came to like arrest both of you is one of Jackie's old friends. And also this Arasaka Corp executive comes down. It's like, oh, just throw him in the river. Kill them. They tried to take my car. Nice. Yeah, there's a lot like it's so weird. I guess it's probably the same as the tabletop RPG, but it's a little more because you're basically role playing in a city that is just constantly being overrun by crime. And being run, owned by these, you know, basically these corporations run this city is the way most of this, like, science fiction kind of deals with it. It's like a mega corporation that has so much more money than, like, the government or the police department or anything like that. Well, I mean, yeah, like, the assumption with, like, cyberpunk, generally speaking, is that, like, governments, as we understand them, have, like, collapsed. Um for various reasons that stem from, you know, bureaucracy to uh, political infighting and corporations just not no longer like restricted by any sort of like government that existed beforehand can just kind of do as they please. So that's how you end up with places like Night City. Yeah. So is, uh, all right. All right. Big question here. Is it going to be Amazon or Facebook that turns into Arasaka first? Let's go. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we're, if we're gonna reach a point where like people look at Amazon or Facebook as like view them as being as sinister as uh, the people is night of Night City view Arasaka. But yeah. I mean, I imagine Jeff Bezos has got some got some uh, crazy stuff. Yeah, I, I these you know these stories of like they like hyperbolize and like as like warnings for people and be like hey don't let these companies get that big that's why the, all the antitrust stuff has been going on which i hope that stuff goes well we'll see but um i don't know the nomad stuff was cool i i just woke up and i was like i was getting my car repaired i have like a shitty beater car and the mechanic's like yeah i can't do anything about this and i was like are you sure about that buddy so i walk up to it and i like unplug some shit and replugged it and i'm like all right this car is good to go and then this cop shows up and he's like, hey, I don't know who you are. This is my town, though. We're in the outskirts. This is my territory. And I'm like, okay, buddy. And then he just, like, babbles on. And you get to drive off. And then you go plug your radio into a the tower so you can go talk with Jackie. And you meet him out in his, like, I don't know. It's some trailer he's meeting you out in. He's got an iguana on his back. And him and the iguana become friends, and it's great. And then you bro fist. It was really cool. That's my story. But yeah, um, I'm trying to think what else happened. I think that's it. It's cool. So also, far. Sorry, what's up? Like you don't you like you do like get brought like dragged into like some like action like car chase sequence, right? Like yeah. by the end of that story, yeah. because you're being pursued by like Arasaka security. Yeah, because the the. The iguana is stolen from Arasaka, uh -huh. and so you have it, and you're trying to smuggle it to to flip it. So you're so after you meet Jackie, you're going through a, a checkpoint, and normally you have like fake credentials, and you go up to the security officer, and he's like, "Oh, hey, this is lost on arrival," which mean normally just means yeah, we're smuggling stuff. Normally, if you're a nomad, you're in with your your group. And my character left my nomad group, so I don't have connections to keep me safe. Because normally they'll let you go because they're working with the groups. So they, the security officer, ratted us out to Arasaka, and as we're leaving, we're getting chased by the police. We were able to ditch them, and we get to some garage. And Jackie was like, "Yeah, I was gonna screw you over and not pay you if that went well, but it didn't. So I guess we're friends now." And I was like, "Ah, oh, thanks for being honest with me." And then we bumped fists. And I got a sweet shotgun pistol. Yeah, like, I will say, well, like, what I do like about every path is just kind of like how every path, like, in this, uh, that you start off with, 
you don't like build a particularly uh, like deep friendship with Chacky like during these missions, right? It's just kind of served up to you as we're both kind of in this shit together now, and we can make the best of it. And so then, like, you spend a year with Chacky, like at the end of every life path, uh, you get this like uh, cutscene where you and Jackie are just going around Night City doing all sorts of nonsense. Like you move in with him and his mother and y'all like start doing jobs. You start like, you know, making it in night city. And by the end of that cutscene, you move out of Jackie's home. You meet, get your own apartment in the Northern like part of night city neighborhood by the name of Watson. And a year has passed and you are now all but free to do as you please. Once you complete one more introductory mission. That that sequence is like this weird montage with like narration over it being like the guy is still then like the voiceover still was like, Hey guys, we're in Night City and there's a bunch of trouble going on and you're running around doing stuff and you're watching like quick cuts of you and Jackie like robbing things, getting beat up at nightclubs, hanging out, having a good time. I I kind of wish it would give you like one job in between that just to meet Jackie a little more but i guess you're kind of meeting him when you do that first job which is to pick up like a high profile target who has a um what i would call is like a life insurance or a health insurance thing where someone is paying you to go rescue them pretty much yeah, yeah. So you are being paid by another fixer whose name escapes me um, to go find a corporate executive by the name of Sandra Dorset because her uh, because her like her chip went dark. I believe Sandra has dealings with this fixer who hired you to do this, and you find out that Sandra is abducted by what the game calls scabs, which are aren't cannibals but are basically cannibals right with like the cyber like punk flavor of these are people who find humans or find people and they like rip out all their cyberware so that way they can either resell it or put it on themselves yeah so you go through this mission and then you're you're kind of you you end up it kind of gives you one choice is you got to shoot all the scabs in this apartment you're like getting into you can and then stealth you it. find oh, can you i guess you can stealth all of them it seems like there's still a lot of enemies in that one. It, there's like a main, like I would, I would call it the living room of the area where there's like a lot of dudes. Yeah. The thing is, is like, if you, if you stealth it, you're going to get like shown a, a golden path basically on your mini map. That's going to take you out around that living room where there's like five dudes and to where their leader is. If you just take out their leader and you can do it, like, whether you do it, like, loud or stealthy, if you take out the leader, they all run. Uh uh-uh. Interesting. And so, you, like, and they, actually, they don't even run. They just die. Like, they all fall uh-huh. over and die. Weird. So you could go and loot their courses. It's a really weird sounds way like of putting a, that sequence together. Sounds like a, um, what you would call it is, like, there are a bunch of bees and you kill their queen. That's weird. But, um, yeah, you go in there, you take them out, and you find her... She's on she's on ice in a bathtub pretty much to to keep I guess people do that when you're like people who like take people's kidneys out they put them in an ice bath too it's supposed to keep like the blood not to come out as much or it keeps like the um what you call it this when they retie you up from like your um the kind of incision but um, yeah i so yeah. i had the um i had the nudity options turned to censored so when i took her out of the bathtub she was like in a bikini i guess did you keep that flipped the other way or did you have I kept, like I, I kept those off because my understanding i didn't know that i was like all nudity i thought that was just like oh you won't have like gen like we won't show your genitals right yeah, so I'm guessing she's normally nude in the bathtub. Like, I, so, oh, she's she's very nude. Yeah, so all the characters who are really. nude have like bikinis on, pretty much for me. It's just like a black bikini with like no line on the top. So I didn't get to adjust my, um, you know, genitalia in the character 
I, I was fine. I I just made I just messed with my character's face. That's all I wanted to do, really. I don't well, put I mean, yeah, body tattoos on because it's cool. More or less, all you can do in that character creator, right? Because all you're doing in that creator is like going through presets that you don't actually get to customize because there are no sliders, and you also can't like change body type or anything. So the only thing that you get really in that character creator is like your face and fingernails. Yeah, I got some sick like red fingernails, but um, I'm surprised this game didn't have like the third person mode which like a bethesda game has because that's how you like you know you you create your character and you only ever see them like in a mirror they don't do like like call of duty last year call of duty modern warfare does like for the first time would was doing cut scenes outside of first person because most of the other games the whole game would just be in first person which this game seems to be doing a lot except when you're in your driving your car pretty much yeah yeah i think it's i don't know it's almost it's an interesting change because i remember when like the witcher 3 like in the witcher 3 you know um they never show you being handed anything because they never animated like hands connecting with items or like connecting with each other but in this game all you see is real all you really see are these hands uh, yeah and people like sitting next to you and staring deeply and intently while they're talking with you. Yeah, everyone just everyone just stares at you in a real like deep way. Like you are the only thing in that room when people are talking to you. It's almost yeah. romantic. Almost. You know, they also set this game up as you being this grand important person. Like like when you get hired by um I have her name written down she is is it evelyn is the girl who hires you to do another job later but she is going through your fixer and she's like yeah i don't want jackie i want something else and your fixer who you're working with is like yeah this guy's the best and evelyn's like you're the best v i need you to do this job i can't trust anyone else and i from what i hear that kind of continues forward or everyone just like V is like the coolest dude. He's just like the best dude. Have you experienced that with like any of your other missions? Or am I talking on my ass, Austin? Set up with like the setup specifically there with that mission. Like after you know, after you rescue Sandra Dorset, whether um however that plays out, like y'all get hired, you and Jackie get picked up by a famous fixer named Dexter Deshaw, uh, who is immediately described as two things a a legendary fixer and b an overweight person yeah, um, folks yeah smoke in that and that's so like jackie will immediately out. tell you like it's like this 300 pound legend i'm like okay yeah um that's whatever kind of dude it. yeah it's it's all muscle austin it's all muscle i mm, maybe i'm like i i am there's like a treatment of decks like within that game. I don't think it's particularly like, uh, we, I, I don't think it's like fat phobic or anything, but it is like kind of uncomfortable in a way. They, uh, they so, should have written it differently. That, you yeah. Know, that's like a poor writing choice, which I, you know, that comes up with other games I play that like, yeah, I'll let you finish your decks thing. And I want to get into the brain dance. Cause that's something that's a poor, like gameplay design choice that I disagree with. But they patched it, but we'll talk about it. Yeah, and like, I mean, I don't think like, the reason I say that, I don't think like Dex, like bring up Dex's weight in the way that people do, like Jackie will call him a fatso, um, Evelyn will like insult him using his weight, like people insult Dex using his weight, but I don't think like the weight is ever like portrayed as being, his weight is ever portrayed as being like a debilitating thing for Dex. Like, it's not, like, he's no less effective at what he does because he is seen as overweight. He's still, like, a really good fixer within Night City. And so it's just, like, the character writing in there makes me uncomfortable, but, like, Dex is still himself, like, an interesting character. Um, And so when Dex reaches out to you, he wants to meet you because he's already met Jackie, right? So he wants to meet you, and he tells you that there are two things he needs you to do. He needs you to procure a flathead robot, and he needs you to go meet up with Evelyn Parker because she wants to meet you specifically and the reason given to dex is that she wants to meet someone who is 
in like who's going to be on the ground floor. Yeah, and I th that was kind of. Oh, sorry. One second. Here, keep talking. I got. I'm losing my voice for a second. Sorry. And yeah, and so when like you and Jackie like get this job, it's seen as very much like the thing that's going to make you, you know, uh, because Dex is Sledge and he only works at the best. And for some reason, he reached out to Jackie. So like Jackie being someone who believes in like the myths that the city, you know, air quote creates, uh, was very excited because for him, this is this is what's going to get him out of his uh, into a better life. I would say, like, get him out of his living situation, like, a bad living situation, but it's never... Jackie's situation is never described as being a bad living situation outside of references to his abusive father. So it's just kind of this weird, like, desire for more that isn't necessarily grounded in, say, a desire to get out of, like, the shit of Night City as much as it is um like jackie's like own desire to just be known by people stand back all right yeah the the evelyn stuff you know i was playing it and she's like yeah i just i just want to meet someone on the ground floor and stuff and i'm just like in my head i'm like they just they want you to meet everybody which you know that's like a video game thing it's like a story building thing it's like a world building thing and so I didn't do the turret thing first. I did. I met Evelyn. Yeah. I thought that sequence was really cool. Where like the first mission, you're kind of like doing the mercenary thing. You're running up, you're shooting people. And I like the brain dance sequence a lot more because you're not. You're doing something more than just like going in and clearing out enemies. You're like investigating and you're like trying to figure out how to rob this penthouse suite where they have a um there's like a microchip in there that's like unique isn't there yeah so within well you don't know this quite yet but within like in what you're trying to do is you're trying to steal something from the head of the arisaka corporation right and it's specifically an item that exists within and I am exist in his apartment, uh, something that you find out later was stolen. And this is uh, this character that you're trying to steal from is uh, Yorinobu Arasaka, who I guess at this point is technically the heir um, to the Arasaka Corporation. And like Evelyn, there's an item that Evelyn knows is there. Uh, she, and she knows what it is, but she's not going to tell you what it is um, until like until later into the game and you have to go through this brain dance where she walks into your Nobu's apartment penthouse is immediately greeted by the heavily mechanized uh adam smasher who is also a character that exists within the lore of cyberpunk 2020 he's like uh he's like Evelyn, you're one hot meat fucking bag or some shit and i was like okay that's God, a good he sucks. yeah <sighs> As a as a cyberpunk dialogue, it was kind of funny. And I was like, "God, that also kind of sucks." It was yeah. just, I was just so I was surprised, but like that. And this is all taking inside the brain dance. You're you're like reliving someone's memories, but so the thing, the other decision that they made is when you get into the brain dance. Originally, it strobe flashed like white and red at you, and that's like a um that gave. Someone in Game Informer a seizure. Let me see if I Yeah, can the reporter it. reporter for Game Informer, uh, Liana Rupert, suffered a grand mal seizure uh, while yeah. going through this sequence. Yeah, which is like that sucks. Like I, I was watching. I was like, because they put this device on you, and it's two different things that are two lights for your eyes, and they both kind of flash a little bit, and then it transitions to white from mine because it I got the past version. But I guess she didn't, so it's flashing white and red. But in my mind when you do that sequence, you could have had the headset on and then just cut to black and then go to the next one. You don't have to like have that sequence in there where you're like 
giving someone the experience of having that happen to them. Yeah, I would say I'd actually argue that just like cutting to black would actually be a really abrupt and interesting choice to have like for that. Just the idea that you can be taken offline so easily. Yeah. In in cyberpunk in that way, because that's also something that you can do to people later. Right. Once you get the ability to uh, reboot people's eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was doing that a little bit. You could just blind them. And like, that's a really scary thing. Yeah, dark dystopian future. I do like some of the hacking. Since we're kind of talking about gameplay and story, I like that you have some options when you're in combat where it'll kind of do like, it's not VATS. Hacking is kind of the equivalent of VATS, but instead of like marking people, you can go in and like, I can knock out someone's senses or I can disrupt them and they'll be like stunned for a little bit. And then there's some other stuff, abilities later on. They kind of do stuff is what they call demons is what people have a call. It's the equivalent of spells, which yeah. you use demons and abilities based on how much Ram you have. Yeah. How much Ram is in your cyber or deck and how MP. much Ram is granted yeah. by your um, like intelligence score is a thing. So like for hacking, most of like what you're going to want to focus on, if you want to do like real hacking stuff is going to be like your intelligence and I believe technical aptitude scores. And intelligence will partially determine what cyber decks you get access to, and that will determine how much RAM you can spend on quick hacks, which are things like rebooting people's eyes and making them blind, or like turning on alarms to distract enemies, or just damaging people's brains. A uh, world out there in Night City, as it turns out. Yeah, but I don't, um... I don't get, I don't get it. I don't get how that's so easy to do. Because uh, it's a video game, they got yeah, they, they got to do something with it. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, and probably one of my biggest problems with like cyberpunk as like a property is I've never really understood why you would buy like cyber optics for yourself if someone can just turn off your eyes on a whim. Yeah, because it's really expensive to turn off someone's eyes. Not a lot of people use it, except everyone uses it, as it turns out. But um, what was I going to say? I I was listening to some people talk about this and apparently i was listening to jeff gersman's off giant bomb he's just like yeah most of the game he was just shooting dudes and he went through a fight and i was like yeah you know i'm probably just gonna i'm probably just not gonna stealth this stuff i don't think i have the patience for that i'm just gonna just gonna shoot these dudes so i'm going in on the weapons austin that's where i'm at yeah so like the thing is is I went into this and I was like, I want to be a real like tech net runner type, right? Because uh-huh. that was the stuff I was always interested in seeing in previews that they never showed, and for yeah. good reason, apparently. For good reason. Um, because it's not particularly interesting from the start, right? Because on the start, you have like five RAM mm-hmm. max that you can use. Getting a new cyber deck is like prohibitively expensive unless you're going out and just doing a lot of gigs. Um, you just you get stuck with a really uninteresting set of abilities. And so it's really hard to see where that can go, right? Especially when you look at how bonkers indecipherable the skill trees in this game are, because they're just a mess of like networks and abilities that yeah. don't actually link to each other in a real way. But what you can like, instead what you can like actively choose to spec in and like, perks to unlock is tied to your specific scores in things like intelligence or body uh technical ability reflexes or cool and then also there's a hidden stat that no one really knows what it does uh i have some theories on what that hidden attribute is though um yeah and i think the um skill tree seems to be laid out by like the most useful skills and the best skills are farther out and yeah. the basic ones are like in the in the middle there. Absolutely. Usually what I what I didn't like the Fallout and the Skyrims and the Elder Scrolls is I I always looked up what the best abilities and spells were after launch. Like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go get to that. Like bloody mess and fallout is when you vat someone, their body might just explode or anyone like, yeah, I'll pick something like that up. I think there's something like that in destruction too, where their body will just like go off crazy. But Yeah. <laughs> And that, like, 
I think I like the Fallout or the Elder Scrolls more is because the bad guys in those are always like less real world. They're farther away from reality. Or like Elder Scrolls is usually some Elder Horror coming out, or the Gates of Oblivion are coming up, or there's a bunch of dragons. And Fallout, it's the end of the world, and you're trying to bring back the water purification plant in three. Whereas yep. in this, it's like, oh yeah, it's it's crime. There's a bunch of crime going on. And then there's the corporations who own the city. So this in this city is also just a lot more this is much more of like a Grand Theft Auto than like an Elder Scrolls where you're not going around finding new small cities or new adventures and stuff. It's all in the city and there's NPCs in there. I mean, you're still probably finding some side quests, but I'm getting vibes that this is more like a Grand Theft Auto like city. Yeah, like the best comparison that I've heard with like Cyberpunk 2077 is that it is GT Online without like the online component, right? <laughs> um, and you know, I don't think that's I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. That's kind of something that I wanted with GT Online for a while because I just didn't want to mess with people in the online of that game. But like so much of this game feels like they took the bones of like the Grand Theft Auto Online of Grand Theft Auto Online and like mixed it in with like a this like weird RPG looter shooter structure, right? Because like all the guns are tier two and yeah. there's such incremental upgrades that they don't matter in any way. And the thing that I'll say about like enemies in this game that I don't like, I don't like how out of its way 2077 goes to like dehumanize your enemies. You know, like the first people that you will actively fight in 2077 are the scavs who are the equivalent of like this game's cannibals. So you'll find other cannibals later um, within Night City, right? Because they're just harvesting people's cyberware and everything. And so it immediately like creates this picture of these like really despicable people who, you know, maybe don't deserve to live. And then you get into stuff like Maelstrom, which have you have you done that mission, the Maelstrom mission? No, is that where you're stealing the um? Yeah, the it's, go, it's it's a it's a robot, um, the Flathead robot, which is an infiltration unit. Like the game, when you go meet the Maelstrom, it's so like in your face about like how wild they've gotten with their cyberware, right? Because they're basically missing the entire top part of their heads and faces. And it's just like immediately wants to paint this picture of like these gangs are out of control with their cyberware, man. You shouldn't feel bad about blowing their brains out. I think the scavenger got I'm on this wiki. I don't think they're actually cannibals. I think they just harvest and sell people's cyber organs. Yeah, well, like that's like they are referred to like with the same way that like people like in stories like refer to cannibals, right? Like that same like disgust that RPG characters will, like, talk about cannibals. Okay, yeah. I So I don't have too much experience with <laughs> with that from, like, other games. But, like, I, you know, you've seen... You saw them in, like... Mission Impossible... Not Mission Impossible. What's Minority Report is those guys who... Well, I guess they're not scavengers, technically, but the people who are helping you get new implants. Sorry, I was thinking about the, uh, the ice tub scene with Tom Cruise. But, yeah, they're... I think they're just people who sell organs, which is like a thing people do, which is a thing people do to make money in that world. I guess. And people probably think they're disgusting, which is like a whole thing because they're murdering people and selling their organs. Same thing yeah. as like what I was talking about earlier, where people sell people's kidneys and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, they do the same thing with like Maelstrom, where like once you go up to the All Foods, where they're all like, the all foods warehouse or the maelstrom or you know have their headquarters jackie's immediately talking about how disgusting he thinks they are he starts calling them borgs oh yeah so i haven't, I haven't done that mission yet but yeah i don't know people they have to set up antagonists and it's just like... yeah i mean they, they they there was a decision made and it was like yeah we're gonna talk about them like this and they're gonna be the bad guys but like it's hard to make a bad when it's so close to like reality where it's like, yeah, it's this city and everything has gone bad and there's a lot of crime. Who's the bad guy? And the 
You have to make one, and there's not... And the reality is, I don't really think there is one. There's just a bunch of people making money, doing bad stuff. Yeah, like, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, within the writing, it wants you to believe that there are bad guys, but, like, the most interesting stuff that exists within cyberpunk as a genre is, like, the admittance that the people you are screwing over are just as important as you are. Uh, yeah, and, like, lead what... lives that should also be, like, considered when you're making decisions about them. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, I'm a mercenary, but I'm also killing people, and the other people are killing people to make money. It's it's a weird, you know, it goes back to, like, is a mercenary in the Wild West, like, a better person than the criminals they're killing, which comes up a lot in, like, like Western, like, movie, like, ideology and like ideas about characters and stuff yeah and i don't know it's just it's like it's a thing with how this like game handles gangs and you're gonna see a bit more of it as you get into uh relations with people like tiger claws and the voodoo boys yeah so i don't know if i'm too into this game I want to do the side stuff and just like my like optimum path is I'm going to do some of the main stuff. I want to get into the weird side stuff where like reviewers have talked about like that's where the story of your what you what decisions you want to make and like your weird interactions with people. And then there's B's story, which is the main story. And they kind of are different characters in a way. And yeah. uh you know, <laughs> we were talking about it. I I digitally bought this on Xbox, and now I realize, oh man, you know, if I'd picked this up from GameStop, I could have probably sold it back to him for like thirty bucks and got something else. So I don't know if I want to be in this city right now. I want to explore the city because it's it's like beautifully rendered, and I think like the ties to like it looks like the city in Ghost in the Shell, the movie and like standalone complex. It's like this deeply woven tall buildings and highways that kind of wrap around it and you got the kind of badlands on the outside i think there's some good stuff in here i just don't care about the main story they're telling like the yeah. mercenary stuff is cool i'll maybe i'll get there you know god i'm only five hours in but i hear it just you're just working for what was it johnny cyberhands was that his name or silver hands yeah close enough and and he you know you yeah, you earlier you described him as a terrorist and like, yeah, you're doing stuff to like probably to uproot Arasaka or to change something with like violent action or stealing or something like that. I'm like, I don't know. I just want to go play Red Dead online, and go be a cowboy. I I might go play more Red Dead too. Instead of Cyberpunk, we'll see. Yeah, like that makes sense. I like the more I get into the main story the more interested I am in like following the stories of characters once they branch off from like your main quests, right? So once you get Johnny Silverhand and like the real con and like the real sort of plot of the game uh, starts when you realize the effects that like having Johnny Silverhand in your head is you know going to do to you and all that stuff. Like there are moments where you do these main story missions and they then splinter off into some side missions that revolve around characters you met in these story missions, right? For instance, um, the the brain dancing technician uh, who you meet in the setup for this heist that you're about to go do, uh, a woman by the name of Judy uh, Alvarez. Once you like go talk to her again after the events of the heist, you get a mission that you can do with her, which is about um like a finding a friend who's been taken and you get some really interesting interactions with like the images that this game the images and like future that this game sort of uh, it sort of shows for like sex work you know um and it's it's like it's a really interesting like look at like what this technology lets people do in, in regards to sex work uh, of course, like the game still calls sex workers whores, so like it's you know it's pretty mixed on that front too. Oof. Uh, but it's it's a really generally speaking, I think it's a really interesting quest. I think the relationship that V has with uh, Judy is like there's a really good dynamic there. 
there's like potentially I know there's potentially a romance there. Yeah, and I think I think so far, like right when I met Judy, I was like, oh, me and Judy are shipping. Like she's way into computers and <laughs> video editing. I'm like, this person's cool. I want to go do quests for them and see what they do with that character. Yeah, Judy's pretty tight. I don't. As you said, are you playing as a dude? Yeah, I'm playing as a guy. Yeah, so I don't think I don't think you can romance Judy. Ah, uh, bummer. Yeah, they have like they do. CD Projekt did the thing where they give uh, characters uh, sexual orientations. Oh yeah, eh, that's all right. Yeah, that's but you will choice. be able to. It's a, it's a choice, but yeah. I like, I'm sure because I kind of Evelyn and Judy were talking. I was like, either these these two were partners at some point, or they're just like really close friends who grew up in night city or have worked together a lot in night city. And there's like, I think there's a really good back and forth between them that, that, that was written pretty well. Yeah. The dynamic and between the, Judy and Evelyn is, is really good. Yeah. So I, I think I'm there in this story more for like the characters interacting and talking to other in the city and like the Merc stuff. It's like the MacGuffin. It's what the story is using to push it forward. Like, why am I in this world? They could have done something else, but Hey, this was their choice. Reviewers have talked about it. Maybe when Cyber, Cyberpunk 2078 <laughs> comes out, maybe they'll... Because like, you talked about it in the pre-release stuff or like in our other video where it's like when the original trailers for this were coming out, in your mind, you were thinking, oh, you're either going to be a merc or a netrunner or something else. You're not going to have like this locked campaign, but it's kind of a linear campaign with a bunch of stuff on the side you get to pick. Right. Yeah, it ter- turns out Cyberpunk 2077 is a video game. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't think I expect anything more from that, right? Yeah. Like, now, the, maybe, maybe another ten years. Who knows? Another ten years. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I didn't, I, I don't think I was expecting, like, the world to change, right? Like, I know people who like bought into this game's marketing. Who were like, oh, this is, there's never going to be another yeah. game like this. Like, this is the first, like, this is a revolution in, like, RPGs. I mean, not really. This was never going to, like, create a new standard outside, like, in any regard. I don't think it's going to create a standard as far as, like, technical capability or, like, just uh, production, like, production uh, value. Mainly because, like, no other company can really reproduce the environment that this game was made in being you know a company that started out with a concept and over the course of about eight years became a like a multi-million dollar uh corporation due to the insane success of a fantasy rpg no one saw coming uh that would continue to sort of benefit benefit them financially through things like continued printing of the books that RPG was based on and the creation of a Netflix show based off of that IP. Love that Netflix show, Austin. I know you're not big into it, but I think I'll get I'll go play The Witcher, Austin. That show makes me want to go play Witcher 3. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did. Like that that The Witcher 3 met like a new like uh, record of like purchases and player engagement when that show came out, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's it's wild. And no one else has that no one else has what that was, you know, like no one else has that sort of that sequence of events. There's no way any company can reproduce that. Or like even produce that kind of thing. Because like see Project did not, you know, like produce those conditions. They just kind of got really lucky. And they didn't how involved are they with that? Here, I'm going to look up this stuff and then talk about Cyberpunk at the same time. Well, with the show? Yeah. They're not particularly involved. Like, Sapkowski is more involved with the show than CD Projekt is. And there's a number of reasons to that, mainly because, like, I don't think the relationship with CD Projekt and Sapkowski is particularly good. They did no. enter, like, a legal battle last yeah. year that CD Projekt was like, okay, we're just going to give them a lot of money. Because yeah. we don't want to be dragged into the middle of a court battle during production of our next big video game. Thanks. So I think... The other thing I'll say about this game is I think it's a PS5 and Series X game. I think they're finishing that stuff. They put it out early. 
this is an early access game because of the, because of some stuff. You know, it's probably maybe it would have been different if COVID didn't happen. This game would definitely have been different. I don't know how different it would have been, but it's kind of you know it's pretty buggy right now, and it works better on a PS4 Pro. But even then, you know, you got some. It's coming in hot. You know, it's coming in like Fallout 4 did, where yeah. I think Bethesda kind of learned those lessons as they're putting games out since the PC days. You know, I I think their biggest leap into consoles was the um, Elder Scrolls 3, Morrowind. And they've been working on having their games less and less buggy, except for Fallout. uh, What was that? What's that Fallout? 76? 77? Oh, yeah, so 76. Funny. Uh, but yeah, Fallout 76 came out in a bad place, but I think like Fallout 4 kind of came out jank, but it usually they're working on it for another year to fix it. Because they have to meet their release date. They kind of come out broken early. or in, I think a lot of people know these games are coming out in early access, these really big games. is fake early access where they still have to it's kind of buggy but there's a lot of consumers who are you know talking about this game right now being like oh i thought when i bought this it was going to be a finished game that's not going to like hard reset my console or you know look like a low game because they cd project red went out of their way to not show off the base ps4 and xbox one versions of this game too that's like a marketing thing yeah i don't I don't think like the like using like a Finnish game. I don't think that's like a particularly right like sort of vocabulary here. I think like definitely optimized is the thing, like polished because like everything that they showed was always like high end PC, you know, like in in the original demo they showed in 2018, like V gets into that limo with Dexter Deshaw and like it is like atmospheric lighting, you know, like light is like reflecting off of his glasses the smoke from his cigar is is like really like well done and then you hop into that like even on a ps4 pro there is no like like lighting within the car itself uh and for the conversation i had with dexter this the car was stuck in his mouth the whole time uh because it like duplicated as he was pulling it out of his mouth and so there are like two different sources where there's smoke coming from. It's just, it was a ridiculous encounter. Well, I think I've I've talked about all I wanted to about Cyberpunk until I play another ten hours of it. I don't know. Did you have any other thoughts on stuff that you've kind of experienced in your yeah the hours you uh, put in? How many how many hours are you in? Have you are you a couple missions past like doing the uh, the brain dance? Yeah. So I'm like I'm about twenty five hours in. Jesus, you uh, you outshot me in the last three days. <laughs> yeah, I. Here's the thing, like I, I don't, I where I come down in this game, I think it's fine. Like I think it is at best, it is a fine open world video game. Yeah. Um, but like you know, I've had, I haven't had like huge um problems on like a pro, like specifically, you know, um, it's been running well enough, and you know, also just kind of have that time. That I can like dump into this real quick, and I'm you know I'm interested enough in like Cyberpunk as a setting. Like, I, the nicest thing I can say about 2077 right now is that if you connect this to your GOG account, you get a free copy of the 2020 core rule book. And I think the best thing anyone can do is connect to their GOG account, get that 2020 core rule book, and start and see about starting like a a campaign in 2020 um yeah after because like when the thing about 2020 as a tabletop game is like you have the space to actually interrogate like the real problems present here in 2077 like we can talk about their technical issues and everything like it was always gonna it was always probably gonna be a technical mess all things considered probably not like to this scale we could never like realize but but there are like real problems in regards to how 2077 like uh sort of represents like people from different cultures and ethnicities like i think those are like the real problems here i think we should definitely be listening to people who bring up like mm, this game really uh, like 
others, the Japanese, in an uncomfortable way, you know, um, as well as like the spaces that like people like the Valentinos are allowed to occupy and that type of thing. And, and then there's also one thing that the game does do well specifically that I found is like your relationship with power, right? And it's the same thing that like cyberpunk when done well enough, like can always hit, which is like everyone is compromised. There is no, real choice other than to participate in a society that has largely given control to corporate rule because you need to worry about putting food on the table and choice is a is a luxury of the privileged in a real way i agree with that yeah yeah and like there there are quests where 2077 gets that really well right like like damn it's good stuff but then like you go back to the open world and like some police dispatchers like hey can you um can you kill these people who didn't pay their rent mm. and you yeah, just i'm not gonna talk to, to the i don't know if i can t- want to talk to the police lady at all i'm like eh, you'll figure it out lady yeah like it's i mean it's kind of like a thing like it allows for a read of like the police are ineffective right so they have to reach out to mercs right and that's just like a part of how ineffective the policing of the ncpd is but like it doesn't give you the option to like subvert the expectations of like what the police want you to do when they ask you to do a job, right? Like I can't go to an assault in progress and talk people down. I yeah. can only go if I want to engage with it, I can only go there to kill people and then get money because that's how you get paid. True. Yeah. I there's some I don't know, I I don't want to blame this on this, but you know they they're a swedish developer and i think certain people from certain countries all they all everyone writes a little differently based on their experiences and i know they have like a very mixed and talented team of people from i'm sure all over the world but i don't i don't know they they get into you get into cyberpunk and it is a multifaceted city that is a lot closer to LA. And I know people like Rockstar, when Rockstar wrote LA and GTA five, it was kind of a parody and the Housers are from the UK. And there's like, you can see like those games have like a, a little sense of like a British humor in it, or it's kind of dry and it's kind of satire that, like their Hauser humor has always been. Yeah. And I don't I think and it's it's a it's a rough thing to take on. Like it's it's a there's a lot of stuff you gotta take on if you're talking about a city that's like this diverse and there's so many people living in it. I mean I don't know what developer I would task with writing it but that way, but I think they should have wrote the way they do the gangs and stuff differently and like well having like you can have someone of an ethnicity but don't give them a stereotypical like which a way of speaking or like what you might call it like people people who do impressions of like an ethnicity will like dig into that like yeah sort of exaggerated accents yeah and i think I, I've played what... games where they don't give them exaggerated accents, and it plays better, and you feel like they're more of a character. Like, you know, you, you see people... Like, you watch westerns, or there's some modern-day stuff where they give southern people that really, like, hickish sound. It's like, oh, y'all, we're gonna go to the barn and do stuff like that. You know, you you see that come up a lot, where it's like, even though there are people who do talk like that, I'm gonna... It's never that exaggerated, and it's never that much. There's just certain phrases people use, and it kind of combines with that. And that's stuff I don't like either. Yeah. Well, it's also like who, right? Like how many people, like how do you identify? Like you can have people like with like thick accents, right? Like that's not in and of itself a problem. The problem is when there is like no, there's no, like there is no Japanese person who does not have a thick accent, right? Like, this game does not seem to believe in like the sort of, I guess the, in like the product of like 
Asian like Americans living in this country for a long time, right? Where they like pick up more of an American accent. Because a lot of a lot of people who you're allowed to interact with, and this is like specifically talking about like Arasaka, are like people who like are are you know are visiting America, right? Like they don't permanently live here. Uh, they are people coming in like from Japan to like represent this company's interests. And but you don't get like a lot of you don't meet like a lot of Asian Americans like who live in Night City, you know. Or at least they're not. If you do, they're not allowed to exist in like the same detailed space. Yeah, and I haven't gotten as far as you in it, but yeah, I think the um, yeah, there's just some weird stuff on that. That's like cultural stuff that I don't like. Even GTA Five, like stereotype their characters in a weird way that i was just like not into also well i mean yeah like this is what happens when like people like in the case of gta on like gta 5 i don't think like rockstar had any interest no. in portraying people with any hint of kindness yeah right? they want to G- do satire and they want to do play it for laughs and they want like your main three characters yeah the the satire of like Grand Theft Auto has always just been the cynical like view of of like an of an entire like city of people from you know the Housers uh, you know from people who like live in the UK and have like seemingly done very little like cons- consulting work on like the type of people who live in places like New York and LA um, and that just seems out of a lack of caring in the case of CD Projekt it sounds like a lack of knowing that they should have. Yeah, and, like, um, you know, it's hard because, like, the promise of, like, open worlds for me and why I've always kind of got them is because you get to live in this space, but then there's there's that story, the emergent storytelling, and then there's, like, the story the main people want to tell. And I always have put more time into the emergent, even in, like, Fallout and, like, GTA San Andreas. I was always just on the outskirts getting to know the city a lot and driving around listening to the radio and doing side stuff. But like, it's always been like, I haven't liked these stories too much. And should I keep buying these games? I'm, (laughs) I'm probably going to be more selective about stuff. Wait for the reviews to come out. Because like, if I wasn't reviewing this, I probably, would have seen their reviews come up and be like, this kind of sounds like not my thing. Like, I love the setting, and I, Blade Runner is my favorite movie. I love Ridley Scott in that. There are some weird stereotypes in that movie, too, for the, um... They're not called fixers in it, but they're, like, the people who do your augments. It's, like, an older Chinese man who kind of speaks broken English. And that movie has some weird stuff in it. But it's, like, not... You know, it's only a two-hour movie. It's like, when you dig deeper into this world, it has more chances of bad writing coming up. That's my weird tangent. But um, do you want to take a break really fast, Austin? Do you have any other thoughts? Ah, Austin is be right back right now. So we will be right back as well. Hey everybody, we're back from our break. Austin had to... His pigs were attacking his dogs. Well, not attacking them, harassing them. The words yeah, you, you know. Yeah. They just, they harass each other, you know, like all, all good family does. And shenanigans. Uh, Absolute all, nonsense. When you dipped out, I was just talking about how, like, I, Blade Runner is, like, one of my favorite movies from, like, score and, like, cinematography. Yeah. That's cool. You know, the world of cyberpunk is cool. I want to get into that, but I don't know. Yeah, like there's some... 20 years, hours, and I'll catch up with you to see how I'm doing at that point. Yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, there's just like, Flavor also has like some trappings of cyberpunk that like, I think we need to like finally interrogate in the mainstream. But yeah, it's still like, cool. Yeah. It's edgy. They want you to, think, they don't want you to think they're edgy because they're doing a bunch of stuff. Um... I've been playing a lot of Red Dead Online, actually. I'm I'm 35 hours in on um, PS4, and that's since December 3rd. So I guess while you've been playing a lot of Cyberpunk, I've just been in the West, not even doing a campaign. 
All right. Hey. So I'm gonna break down what I've been doing. When you get into it, you have like I've been finishing up my mission sets, which are you get good karma and bad karma mission sets based on three missions you do for some mayors. And those each have five missions. And then after that you have two more missions at the end where you do like a robbery and you can get a bunch of money. And I negative karma first to do the to do the negative karma missions, and then I good karma to get a to do so I could unlock the good missions. So it lets you do both, which is cool. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I can just get a bunch of money, so I can go buy my dumb shit. How do you farm karma? Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> so to get my bad karma, I had to go to a town and just murder people. Mm-hmm. I was gamifying the system. Yeah, speaking of you know, if it's in the West, it's cool. You know, if it's in like a real city. I'm not cool with it, but um, I'm just trying to make the numbers go up, Austin. Yeah, I get it. Video games be video games. Yeah, so I was I'm a, I became a bandit and I went to a town and I uh, caused some ruckus. And if you shoot horses, it's a, they they penalize you really bad for it. And then to become a good guy, you just go do bounty hunter missions and you pet your horse and you feed him. You know, like a good cowboy. These are two morally equivalent acts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and you can pay some dude the real money currency, gold bars, and he'll flip your karma for you. Okay. Um, so the gold bars they actually changed that. Um, you you have daily logins, so uh, you'll have a streak. So when you get to a week, a streak of one week of logging in every day and doing one daily, which will be like shoot five turkeys or. Do one bounty hunter mission, or I had one yesterday that was skin two oxes, or I had one that was pick five vanilla flowers. If you do like one of those, you'll get a daily. And when you when you do seven in a row, you'll get a multiplier that makes the amount of gold you get from a daily more. Because there's one gold bar, and then there's nuggets, which is like point one nugget. When you get the yeah. like three weeks of playing in a row of doing one daily, you can get a multiplier of like 0.5 nuggets, like per daily completed or something. And you use the gold to buy your missions, which it kind of sucks, but for the people who've been playing Red Dead's online since it came out, they have a lot of gold. So Rockstar was putting out like the Moonshine pack for 25 gold which is the moonshine set of missions where you can produce and collect materials to make moonshine, and then you have to go sell it to cities. And they're all like, they're all written missions where it's like, hey, you start out in Strawberry, and you have to go to Valentine to drop off your moonshine. So it'll give you a point, a beginning and an ending point to go drop it off. And that's one role. That's the most recent role that came out. I think that was like last year. But when it launched a couple months after they put out they give you the bounty hunter, which is where you go collect someone who's doing yeah. bad stuff. It'll be like a uh an NPC, just a regular non player character. They'll have a gang around them. You you defeat the gang and you can take them dead or alive and you get more money if they're there's a collector one which the map is preset with a bunch of collectibles. It's like two hundred and they're all sets. So you'll have a set of tarot cards you can sell to this lady named Madame Nazar. And you'll have some antique bottles to sell to her, which you find, and some other stuff. So that you have to buy a collector bag from her for 15 gold bars before you can do those missions. Then there's a trader who you're dealing in like hunting. Like, um, selling, you're going and hunting and collecting animals to sell for their economy. That one's 15 gold bars. And then the last one is like trader, where you're doing. We that. still have the naturalist? Yeah, the naturalist is the other one. That one's like collecting flowers and stuff. It doesn't make you a lot of money. Mm. So, people on the internet have discovered which ones are the best ones to get money. They've they've like clocked out like which one gives you the best gold bars per hour and which one gives you the best money per hour. Of course, the collector is really cool. 
Because someone just made a map online of where everything is, and I can just look at it and make a path, and I can go collect everything of one set and go flip it for like six hundred dollars and go buy my gun. Like a, for example, like a pump action shotgun was like four hundred, or I can get like an elephant rifle for six hundred. The Lamat was like three hundred yeah. for the revolver. So everything's a little more expensive than the campaign of Red Dead Two, just because they want people to be grinding in their game to go pick up the stuff they want or maybe you can spend gold bars on it they have a oh, yeah. thing where instead of paying money you can buy it with a gold bar and it's like yeah it's like a maybe less like gold bars and say like the dollars that you'd earn correct correct it's, it'll be like i could buy my 350 dollar shotgun for like 10 gold bars instead and 10 yeah. gold bars is about i think it was for ten dollars, I get twenty-five gold bars. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And then for twenty dollars, I could get fifty-five gold bars. So they give you a little more if you spend more money. You know, like yeah. mobile games. Yeah, my you know, goal... like three <laughs> gold bars. Three so gold my bars. Goal right now is to put no more money into Red Dead Online. I bought it. I bought five dollars with the gold bars, which was the intro pack, and it gave me twenty-five. So I'm just kind of role playing as a cowboy, making money to buy my dumb shit and get um. You can get a bounty hunter wagon later. They can put the um, the bounty targets into so they don't get shot. Because if someone shoots a bounty target on your horse, they'll die. And then you can get a wagon for like trading too, where you can put more animal carcasses in there to sell. It's fun. I was playing with some people the other day. If you get in a group and a posse, and everyone has the bounty hunter role. You get like a multiplier for experience, so you'll get more because everyone's doing it. And what else like, is do fun? These, do these jobs like interact with each other? So none of them ever cross paths at all. They just each have their own, they're they're each own strain of mission. You'll have one non-player character in the world who is the starter for that mission. Who will, you'll get a cutscene. So like the naturalist was some lady talking to your, um. He basically, he's like a pelter. He collects pelts and skins animals and does it for, like, uh, taxidermy. And she's talking to him, being like, oh, this is wrong. Leave animals alone. And, she's, and she sees you coming, and she's like, hey, Mr. Player character, who's me, who does not talk at all. He, It's like the Destiny character, where they just watch people interact, but don't say anything themselves. Yeah. And she's like, hey, if you agree with me, come out with me, and I'll give you a thing. For 15 gold bars and you can do the natural and you'll go sell sets of flowers for her and there's some other stuff i haven't dug into the naturalist so i'd rather spend my gold bars somewhere else right now so i want to buy the yeah. moonshiner apparently the moonshine set of missions has a lot more like what i would call the more prestigious missions the more written missions where you're actually doing stuff not just like collecting random stuff to sell or doing bounties the most recent release, December 3rd, they have an upgraded tier for the Bounty Hunter, which is actually, like, the prestigious Bounty Hunter. Yeah, because you get, like, legendary bounties is what they're doing now. Yeah, so there's a couple named bounties where they give you more money and they're harder. And then there's also... Every town of the 13 towns will have one bounty that has a, th a three-part bounty that are better bounties. It's a longer mission. and there's about, so it's about 45 bounty missions that are better than the base bounty hunter stuff. So that prestigious bounty hunter is, act, is actually kind of worth it. And you could upgrade for 10 gold right when it came out. So I just, I, I had some gold because when you are on Amazon Prime, remember? There's like Prime Gaming. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have that. I had it because I... You know, it helps me pay less for shipping, and they got some good movies, and it works in my lifestyle. So, I um, it gave me a thousand dollars. It gives you the original bounty hunter roll for free, and then it gave me a free horse, and I think I got some gold from it too. So it just kind of gives you a starter pack, so you can be like, "Hey, here's a thousand dollars. I bought the three weapons I needed, and then I upgraded some stuff, and I got set up doing bounties." So there's like minimal stuff. 
minimal input. I haven't been grinding too much. Like, I, I haven't felt the need to, like, go out of my way to, like, pay them money to get this dumb shit. Like, I can get it myself. There's a, It's pretty easy to make good money, even with by yourself or with other people. Okay. Yeah. It's fun. Like, yeah, because I remember, Try. like, I just, I just remember that being my main problem when that game, like, launched, was I, like, me and some friends, like, goofed about for a bit, and I'm pretty sure we ended up, like, just tying each other up in rope <laughs> and, like, dragging each other around on horses, but, like, I, it's, it's good to hear they actually have, like, some proactive um, things that you can do to earn some money. Yeah, because so I think when that game originally launched, they only had those karma missions I was talking about. Yeah. And the shootout elimination series, which are, if you're familiar with GTA Online, they have, like, playlists for, like, racing, team deathmatch, and, like, a capture the flag thing or something. Yeah, And I think much. that's all they launched with. But now they have, like, this stuff where you can, like, go do some missions. Go do some stuff with your friends. So when I was playing with my friends, we were like, oh, we're going to start off by doing bounties. We're going to level up and get some experience and get some money. And then we're going to go... Then we went off and did some team deathmatch for a little bit. And then we ended with some moonshines. So, so I don't have the moonshiner pack, but because one person in my group had the moonshiner... Y'all can all come and get experience and get paid out for it. I just don't Dope. level up as a moonshiner for finishing it. Because when you level up in the rolls, you unlock new cosmetics and new items and stuff. And there's a battle pass. Battle oh, pass. Boy. <clears throat> the I people who it. used to play this all the time have a bunch of gold. So they can buy the battle pass for 40 gold, but I'm not going to buy that. It's fine. It lets you mass cook meat, though, at your campfire, but you can only do it individually. Right? Yeah. It's like you can, so you only make meals for yourself. Yeah. All yeah. right. That, eh. But when you mass cook meals, you can... Um, it's still you're only eating it for yourself, and you can't really sell that stuff, I think. But you can cook, like, five cooked muttons at once instead of doing them individually. Which I think... 40 gold bars was 20 bucks. So that's their battle pass. I think it's seasonal. So I think they do four battle passes a year or something. I might be wrong. Who knows? But there's people who have like 300 gold because they remember the dailies I was talking about? Yeah. So the way the system used to be is you would get the 28 dailies for 28 days and it would keep your modifier of like your gold, and it wouldn't reset that. So you'd always be at the max modifier. So people were doing that for a year, grinding gold, but now every month it resets, and it goes back to zero, and you have to regrind to get the fourth week modifier or the 28th day modifier. But people used to just, like, I was watching this guy's YouTube channel. He had, like, 200 gold and, like, $100,000 because he makes his videos, and he just plays it a lot. But I think Rockstar wanted to make more money off of this, so they changed the way their bounties, the way that oh. daily work, not the bounties. I want to make money off of their online mode. Yeah, because I don't think people were buying gold in the online stores. They were just grinding their dailies yeah, to get their modifier it. for the gold and completely bypassing the need to give Rockstar money to buy stuff. They're buying it themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah. I... Which, I guess that's an oversight in production, but you know it happens. It took him a year to fix it. Yeah, and I'm sure, like you know, the sort of like the philosophy, like Red Dead, like too. I don't think like at the time I didn't know if online was like what they wanted to be their main source of income, like from that game, considering it did release like a month after the original game. Yeah, and I know they were thinking. I'm sure, they wanted it to be as popular as GTA Online, which is still striving right now, even though it came out in what. 2014 was GTA 5? That was 13. 2013, yeah. On a PS3, PS4, and PS... Going to come out to PS5 soon. People with the PS5 can play it before, but they're going to have an optimized version for it. But yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think it it did as well. They're still putting stuff into it for the people who like it more. And... 
you still like there was a GTA Online content drop like at least a month ago. They're doing some new heist, so they're they've always been doing stuff for that. So I think that's their for focus more, but maybe some more roles will come out. I'm curious to see. Maybe they'll finally let you just I don't know build a ranch. Man, I'd be into that. I want they because you can't buy houses yet in Red Dead Online. You only have camps that you set up. Oh. Yeah. So I I don't have an apartment like an a quote apartment because in GTA Five you could buy apartments and houses and stuff. Yeah, but, that was like my favorite part of GTA Online. Yes, yeah, so you can invite your homies over and you can smoke a bowl and watch some TV and drink in your dumb apartment. Yeah, it's true. There's like four TV programs, but you know. Yeah. Always fun. Yeah. So what have you, what have you been playing? You were you're playing. I don't have my list up. I'll... I was playing before the monolith that uh -huh. we obligatorily let Cyberpunk 2077 be. Um, I was playing some other dope Cyberpunk games. I'm going to give you a real like quick lowdown on uh, the first of them being uh, Neo Feud, which is a sort of point-and-click adventure set in a cyberpunk world. Uh, and this game was made by a company named Silver Spook Games, which I believe is a single-person developer uh, based in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, and this game is sort of, yes, yeah, so this is... Yeah, so the art, writing, programming... I'm on their website now. The art, writing, programming, music, and audio were made by one person, uh, Christian Miller, uh, who is the Silver Spook. And this is a game where, you know, it starts off, and it's it's very much a cyberpunk game about, like, class struggle, right? Like, you start off, and the first thing you get is an introductory cutscene about some nefarious deeds being planned by the, uh, by the like, ultra 1%. Uh, before you're dropped into the shoes of a uh, Carl Carbon, who is currently my protagonist. I'm pretty sure there are multiple characters you control, but I've only played as Carl here for a moment, who is a uh, social worker. Who basically, like within the vision of this future, is you are a social worker who goes around and, and determines whether or not um, robotic citizens, uh, who are referred to like tentatively as like hybrids sometimes get like government assistance and this is really sort of um sort of examines like who this type of program is actually made for because even though like this is supposed to be for you know uh robotic citizens and like people those like people on that like in those margins you don't really get the sense that this system that you're like working within was made for them right like the first situation you find yourself in is like you drop your id as you're getting your wallet because your robotic arm your robot arm malfunctions you drop your id out of your wallet and you have to go back and find it and it's been picked up by a robotic woman who is like needs to use it because she's about to take like an aptitude test to determine i guess sentience um and she wants to use your ID so in that way she can just like ace it instead of failing it. Because this would be like the third time she's taken that test. So you get drawn to this thing where you have to just kind of let her do it. Um, and, you know, you let her take this test, you let her use your ID, it immediately flags it. Uh, a cop pulls a gun on her, and you have to neutralize the police officer by like hot wiring uh your taser that's in your robot arm to like shoot the like the i guess the i guess are they bolts like the wired bolts that get shot out of modern tasers uh and like embed themselves in people like you have to hit this cop who's immediately like a parody of cops in like you know in the way that i don't want to say parody but it's like a very extreme like version of like a cop who wants to do their wants the job because he wants to shoot people, you know, which is, you know, you look at cops, not particularly far off the mark, all things considered. And he immediately is like referencing a movie where he saw someone do a really cool thing and he wants to, you know, do that. He's just about to shoot the throw at one with like, without a care in the world. So you have to stop this police officer. 
Um, and like that's just kind of like the first bit of it. I don't know if I want to get into too much more because it's a really cool. B also like pretty cheap right now. It's currently on sale on Itch and Steam for less than five dollars. Uh, and like it, it goes, it's so far or like is this the other one. This is Neofute still. Okay, cool. Just check. And it gets it gets into some really cool territory. Like I'm just right now got to a section where I have to determine whether this like family of robots has access to basically if this if this couple this these robotic parents can keep their children by like going around their apartment and all the questions that I'm that I have to like cross off and answer are all written for like humans. You know, uh, so like it's very much like yelling at me that these people have been left out of the system in a very intentional way, and this sucks. Uh... So that's Neo Feud. I've also been doing, uh, going through the Shadowrun games still, Dragonfall, and a bit of Hong Kong. And these are like both of those Shadowrun games are two very interesting, uh, like looks into the Shadowrun universe. I would say those are probably two of my like favorite like cyberpunk games that have come out in recent memory. Specifically, like, Dragonfall, because of the narrative space it inhabits by, like, putting you in a functioning anarchist, like, community. Uh, and, like, the more I get into Dragonfall, the more, like, I realize why this absolutely took over my life in 2018 when I finally got around to playing it. That's cool. Hey, man, is that one a, um, like, a turn-based... Game yeah, it's like, like an action game. yeah, like refer, like going back into Dragonfall, like you just spoke of this earlier, but just like reiterate, it is like a tactics, like shooter game in the vein of like XCOM, right? It's like okay. the Fire Axis 2012 XCOM game. Cool. Oh, hey, I was gonna say, I make quick, quick uh, correction. I said CG Project Red was a um, Swedish developer. They're Polish. My bad. I get my Europe mixed up sometimes, as it turns out. I mean, yeah. I mean, of course, you do, you know, uh, like I know, like some people, like a lot of people in the U.S. don't really know how to identify like other states within the United States, you know, so. We're also going to get also going to get Europe confused. Yeah, it's like it's the ish end at the end of the word that will like, oh, which one was it again? I just need to go look at it because they're 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 a prolific game company. I should remember it. I'll probably even note in the uh, podcast notes too. So I think that was kind of rude of me. But yeah, um, uh, if we ever do stream stuff, I kind of want to watch you play Shadowrun Dragonfall one time. I really like XCOM stuff. I mean, yeah, it's a... Mm, 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 maybe. Yeah, who knows? I think it's a cool game. It's pretty easy to run. So like, even without like a capture card, I could probably do it. Yeah, um, and if you're on PC, yeah, you, you can use, um, what should we call it? OBS. OBS and just throw it on Twitch also. <clears throat> Maybe. I need to look into the uh, Giant Bomb was using a thing where they will screen share their PC pretty much. And you can stream it to me without like, with basically like no latency because it's all on the company's back end. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Are they using like a service for that, or is that like a CB? Well, actually, they're not even CBS anymore. No, they're with Red Venture, but it's it was a yeah. service they were using. I, I'll have to see if it's paid or not. I'll see if there's like a free version or something. Who knows? I'm just, I'll I'm gonna do some research on screen sharing stuff. I think Discord has a thing for it too. You know, we'll Discord does it. with like hey. specific games. Yeah, I think it works with anything you play on your PC. Yeah, I mean, I know I've got, like, it only alerts me on, like, specific games. Like, I'll boot up, like, The Witcher, and I'll be like, hey, you want to stream this game to your friends? I'm like, ah, no. I think it's, like, a, it's not in the game. It's actually, like, a, a thing. But it, yeah, it's, I'll like, it Discord up. thing. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But that's cool. Hey, uh, good cyberpunk talk, you know. I, um, we'll definitely be back next week. We got some more news to talk about. There's some more cyberpunk stuff about people wanting to get refunds we'll get into next week some other news that's coming out yeah so, i imagine uh, this will just be like the start of a law of like the start of cyberpunk talks um which like you know i'm excited to like get into a bit more as we do like this was a bit like 
bit of a messy introduction and that kind of thing. And of course, like, I mean, you know, it would be. We're both relatively early. So I'll uh, I'll definitely catch you next week, Austin. Where can they find you? At? Uh, on the sure. internet, you can find me at on Twitter at Beardless Two T W O. And I am Travis Twenty Three Doyle on Twitter. And uh, all right, I, hey, we'll catch y'all next week with our stuff.